Aloha, welcome to today's presentation, 1700s lightning rod fashion. We're going to talk about some strange things around the 1700s and even going back further in time. Those things that have to do with people wearing clothing that were designed to manipulate electricity that was in the air. So I thought this was really interesting. I'm going to show some pictures to everyone and I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit from this Wikipedia article on the subject. All you have to do is type in lightning rod fashion. And by the way, hello to everybody in the chat. Thanks for being with me today. Uh, we are a little bit later than usual today. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm up late, so I thought I would do a live stream. All right, cool. So let's jump into things. I'm going to go ahead and start uh, sharing some stuff about this lightning rod fashion. And I'm going to share some pictures here as we go. Now, in this Wikipedia article, an official article on the subject, check this out. People wore, before I start reading it, people wore lightning rods on their heads. They put them on top of their parasols also known as umbrellas, and they would hold them up and walk around outside in order to keep from being struck from lightning. Now that sounds strange to us today because we don't live in conditions where that's something that's very common, unless of course you're walking around during an extreme electrical storm, then I could see that happening, right? Um, but we don't really have those conditions today. I believe, and I talk about here on my channel quite often, how our conditions were altogether different the further back in time we go, that our atmospheric and geologic conditions changed and have been changing. And we're not used to, we're, we're used to the conditions that we now live in during the modern age, where electricity tends to be more lacking in the atmosphere than it once was going back in time. Now, reading this Wikipedia article, it says here, oh, and actually one more thing, lightning rods are not designed to attract lightning, contrary to popular opinion. Um, I do say that time and time again here on my channel, but repetition helps us to remember. Lightning rods actually help to repel and to dispel the electricity that's directly above them it doesn't make it impossible for lightning to strike, but it does make it more difficult for lightning to strike. Okay, so let's let's t keep that in mind as we go forward here. Now, in this Wikipedia article, lightning rod fashion, it says lightning rod fashion was a fad. A fad is something that you know they do it for a little while, but it's passing. I'm going to show you how I don't believe it was a fad. Lightning rod fashion was a fad in late 18th century Europe after the lightning rod invented by Benjamin Franklin. Um, we're going to talk about that right now. Uh, the lightning after the lightning rod invented by Benjamin Franklin was introduced. That takes us to our first picture and our first topic tonight. I've heard this a lot. I hear I hear lots of things in school, in the school system and academics and academia colleges from colleges to elementary schools and preschools and kindergartens they teach all sorts of fallacies things that are that's 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 a kind way of saying they lie to you and to your children for example many people will walk around in this in this world that is basically idiocracy come to life and they will say things that they believe are 100% true because they are rumor about history. For example, George Washington had wooden teeth. No. I doubt George Washington even existed. I've done a whole video about that. Um, but even if he did exist, it's very doubtful and extremely unlikely his teeth would have been made of wood. Right? Um, 
Another thing, Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. That's insane that Benjamin Franklin would have discovered electricity after thousands of years of electricity having been evident and all over the place in the entire world, and especially if what I believe is true, that the atmosphere was extremely electrically charged in times past, that one guy in the late 1700s would have discovered electricity. And then some people would say, oh, well, no, he didn't discover it, but he did an experiment. And, you know, the, the typical story where he, he does this experiment where he goes out into a lightning storm, according to the legend, right? This is a myth. This is not real history. This did not happen. At least, I'm inclined to... I'm, I'm disinclined to believe that it did. Okay? The, stories go, the story goes, and we're all taught um, that Benjamin Franklin went out into a lightning storm. This genius inventor, <laughs> this great mind of our time, took a kite... During an electrical storm, according to the story, went out, tied a, conduct, tied a conductive metal, a key, to the string of the kite, and went out flying in the rain. So that he could, and this is what you'll see when you pull this up on Google. You'll see unlimited images of, allegedly, Benjamin Franklin, or his likeness, out there with his son in an electrical storm flying a freaking kite and oftentimes they'll put lightning up there hitting the kite and all sorts of things right uh sometimes they put the other end of the string went down into a laden jar so he could try to capture the lightning in a bottle there are so many things wrong with this story so back to wikipedia when it says things like um lightning rod fashion was all the rage after um the lightning rod was invented by Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, I doubt, with all of my being at this very moment, that he invented the lightning rod. It sickens me that some of these famous and historic inventors that are promoted and put on pedestals and sometimes deified by the United States of America are... Um, are the ones that they say claimed so many of these wonderful inventions or made so many of these wonderful discoveries as if we've only discovered things in the past one, two, or possibly 300 years when nothing is new under the sun. So, they say that uh, Benjamin Franklin went out in a lightning storm, in an electrical storm, flew a kite, tied a key to it so that the key could draw a charge, also put a, a lightning rod or a type of lightning rod a metal wire up on top of the kite in addition to that that the string was made of hemp that would become wet from the rain and therefore it would be more conductive right and that the electricity hopefully would hit the kite travel down the string hit the key traveled uh then he had another piece of string that was um, less conductive. It, w it wasn't hemp, it was silk, and it was, it's less conductive. So the theory goes, the, the myth and the legend goes, that the electricity was supposed to stop once it hits <laughs> the silk string that he's holding onto. Um, and then somehow it would still keep going, bypassing his fingers, and enter into the Leyden jar, which is right here on the ground, as you can see. There are so many things wrong with this legend. It's not true. I don't believe it. If you want to believe it, that's fine. That's up to you. But this allegedly happened in 1752. And they say he invented the lightning rod at this time. In this manner. Like, discovered electricity and all of these things. They're not true. Okay? They're, they're highly doubtful. And it's retarded for any famous inventor, especially somebody who studies electricity and physics and other things like that, to go stand out in the middle of a lightning storm and fly a freaking kite. But if that's true, then he's an idiot. And you and, and people have his picture on the one of the most expensive forms of currency that we have here in the United States. What does that say about the people? Hmm. 
Anyway, so he's out there flying his little kite in the lightning storm, right? They always draw pictures of it. This is how it's portrayed. This is how people remember. People are very visual, okay? So when they, when they allow things like this to permeate the entire internet, right? This never happened. Even according to ancient historic records, this did not happen. What really happened and where this comes from is that he had a theory and he had an idea which he wrote about supposing that somebody did go out into a lightning storm and did do this. And somehow through the telephone game of time that turned into he did it. And this really did happen. And George Washington really did have wooden teeth and chopped down a cherry tree. And all the other retarded, lame, trivial things that we were all taught as children by our educational systems. Going back to the Wikipedia article, it says, Lightning rod fashion was a fad in the late 18th century Europe after the lightning rod invented by Benjamin Franklin was introduced. Angel Wings, hey, good to see you. <coughs> Pardon me. Lightning rod hats for ladies and lightning rod umbrellas or parasols for gentlemen were most popular in France. Let me read that again. Lightning rod hats for ladies and lightning umbrellas for gentlemen were most popular in France, especially in Paris. The concept that inspired the fashion was that a lightning bolt would strike the Franklin-designed protective device instead of the person. And then the electricity would travel down a small metal chain into the ground harmlessly. Right. Well, let's just think about this, first of all. Let's suppose that you're in an area that has a lot of lightning. Stands to reason there's probably going to be some rain and the ground is going to be wet. So even if they did have... Let me just get... Let me show you some of these more pictures, right? Even if they did have uh, something grounding, like let's say you're holding this umbrella and it's got a little lightning rod on the top and for some reason the lightning hits the, the rod, which it's, it's designed not to do that, um, but if it does hit the rod, it would travel down the little wire, which is how uh, grounding works. It would go down to the ground and then it would f go all throughout the puddle that you're standing in and electrocute the crap out of you anyhow, unless of course you're wearing rubber boots. Right? Unless your feet are protected. Check this out. Real quick. Back to Ben Franklin. I forgot I had all these little pictures. Check this out. This says right here. This is from more. This, this is what they write about, right? They show him touching the key and all this crazy stuff. It says here, a kite. Let me make that bigger. Check this out. They state this like it's a fact. A kite and a key are hardly scientific instruments. However, they were the best Benjamin Franklin had to prove that thunderclouds carry electricity. <laughs> I mean, were people that dumb for thousands of years that they couldn't figure out that electricity was in the clouds and that lightning was electricity? It seems to me that it wouldn't take a genius to figure that out. <laughs> you could see a little electric spark and you see a giant electric spark. It, 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 it doesn't take too much proving to figure that out. That's pretty common sense, I would assume. Maybe not in today's world where the people are idiots. <laughs> in general. Okay, don't take it personally, but most of the world today strikes me as being retarded and dumb. Um, for more information on that, check out my video called Season of Satan. We talk all about that, and we're going to talk more about that in the future. But look, they state stuff like this like it's a fact. Right? That's all he had. Alright. Hold on. Did I get any pictures? Let me get those pictures. I'm going to come back to these real quick in just a second. We're going to talk about ancient architecture and its relationship to uh, the amplified electrical atmosphere. But for now, I'm going to put this up here so you can see some examples of this clothing, this fashion trend. Let's get back to the article. The concept that inspired the fashion was that a lightning bolt would strike the Franklin-designed protective device, which is a rod of metal. I, I very much doubt Benjamin Franklin invented a, a pointy metal piece. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that pointy metal piece is all, all over the place. I don't know. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, so they would put this lightning rod on top, right? 
and it would hit the purse, it would hit the lightning rod, and then it would go down this little, uh, this little grounding device, which is what this would be, right? And then it would ground itself to the ground, it would stay away from the person. In theory, that makes sense. So, it makes sense that, that, that people would have things like this if the air was electrically charged to an extreme degree. I doubt, okay, I don't know, I mean, common sense says, don't go walking around in a thunderstorm, in an electrical storm, right? Um, if you're out doing your farming or something for some odd reason during an electrical storm, go inside until it's over, you know what I mean? Like, uh, academics tries to insinuate that the further back in time we go, the more stupid people were, and I believe just the opposite. I believe they were more intelligent. So I believe things like this were actually created from intellect and for a purpose and purposefully with a with a good reason or reasoning behind it right let's continue on it says here the technology was already used to some extent in france to protect wooden buildings this technology <laughs> i don't know if it's technology but whatever uh, the technology was already used in France to protect wooden buildings and was therefore an accepted science concept that developed into a temporary fashion. This is not the first time that people wore clothing or uniforms, which we'll show you here in just a second, that was designed to manipulate the flow of electricity. People have been manipulating the flow of electricity since ancient times. We have forgotten about antiquitech or antique technology, right? We tend to just put the modern age up on a pedestal and tell all the rest of history that we invented these things and that we are superior to the rest of history when in reality we're declining intellectually, physically, in all forms and all ways. Now, it goes on to say background. Here's a little background on it. The lightning rod invented by Franklin, see that they repeat it again. The lightning rod invented by Franklin in the mid 18th century to protect wooden structures did not become commonplace in the United States until the 19th century, over 50 years after he first unveiled the concept. <laughs> However, his experiments made electricity a fashionable topic in European society. It goes on to say, in 1778, experiments were performed testing the concept of placing a lightning rod above a person's head in an accessory to protect them from lightning strikes. So you have to imagine, it must have been a common occurrence. It must have been some sort of a nuisance that existed at the time, which doesn't exist as much today, and therefore we don't, there's, there's, there's no need to, to worry that much about electricity zapping you from above unless you happen to be standing in an electrical storm, right? Look how they dressed back then. I very much doubt they just walked around in the rain all the time so often that they, it would it that there would be a need to put lightning rods on their heads and grounding devices trailing off the backs of their dresses etc it goes on to say a woven metal ribbon was placed around a lady's hat and a small chain made of silver was attached to the ribbon the chain was meant to run down the back of the lady's dress and drag on the ground the electricity of a lightning strike to the ribbon would theoretically travel down the chain and into the ground, thus protecting the wearer of the hat. The supposed protection that this type of hat offered made it a popular Paris fashion trend in 1778. The lightning hat was called La Chapeau Baratonnerre in French. A gentleman's 1778 version of the lightning hat involved an umbrella with a tip extended into a pointed rod above it. A metal chain ran from the rod over the exterior of the open umbrella and down to the ground, thus providing a conduit for the lightning to follow. In French, the lightning umbrella was called la parapluie uh, paratonnerre. The French physician and writer Claude Jean Vu de Lunay demonstrated a portable telescoping 
lightning rod that was six meters long, 20 feet long. It's, it's retractable, like, like those old-fashioned TV antennas, you know what I mean? When it was fully extended. This was intended for use by people in open areas such as a farmer in their field. You just have to imagine, right? I, I very much doubt that people were that dumb that they were like, Oh, yes, have you heard of the lightning rod? It, it was practical, which is why it was popular. It's obviously not fashionable. It looks ridiculous. But it must have served an actual purpose, aside from just the, you know people being scared into buying something, which does happen. But I can't believe that everyone would just walk around not a cloud in sight. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, the air, the atmosphere, was more electrically charged. This is my ongoing theory. That our world goes through these atmospheric fluctuations. That it goes through energetic fluctuations. We'll talk about that guy here in just a minute. And when we go through these fluxes, the air becomes extremely electrically charged above our heads and around us, or it minimizes as it seeps down into the earth and charges and returns down into the earth to, to charge itself once more, right? In the humorous play, La Palais de Cristal ou les Parisans, anyways, I don't, it doesn't matter if you guys speak the French, there was a funny play that was written on the occasion of the Great Exhibition in 1851 by Clairville and uh, Valdebel. And there is a scene presenting a version of the lightning hat. as a, And they present it as a Chinese invention. This is very interesting that they would have got... And, and often this happened, right? In ancient... In, uh, in Paris, France, in like 17s and 1800s, they were known for being all the rage and getting all the latest fashion and ideas and inventions and whatnot from all across the world. China being one of those places, right? That is the article. Now, let's talk about clothing. Actually, let's talk about the atmosphere. Let me go back. Let's talk about architecture and lightning rods. And did Ben Franklin really invent the lightning rod? I very much doubt it. Why? Because there are mounds of evidence the world across in the form of our architecture that shows us that the air, that our atmosphere, was electrically charged to a high degree in ancient times, in times past, which, is, which gave rise to a style of, of architecture that we now call Gothic. <coughs> Pardon me. Which means, of the gods. So, this Gothic style of architecture is most notable for having so many points all across it. All of this very pointy structure all the way around it. Why? What, what would have been... I can't... I can't reason that it's just, it looks real pretty. It's a big spiky building. Why is that pretty? What makes that, I mean, yes, it's beautiful today. It's artistic, etc., because it's so much different. But there's something about it that resonates with us, which is why we find it so artistic. It's practical. It's useful, or at least it used to be useful, and it would definitely be, definitely be useful if there was a highly electrical electrically amplified atmosphere directly above it, especially if it's a very important building, especially if it's a godly building, especially if it's a place where you have many people gathering together, or even the gods themselves, which were known to be gigantic, which oftentimes you'll find on these buildings, giant doorways. The ancient quote-unquote gods were known to be giants two, three, four times taller than your average person today. Look how tall this doorway right here happens to be, right? These cathedrals, these ancient Gothic structures, magnificent large houses, temples, etc., all with pointy tops. These are lightning rods. I, I mean, it's, it's a very strong possibility that the, that the reason they would adorn their entire important building for gathering or protecting, you know, their, their ancient leaders 
or those who took over the houses of the ancient leaders, that they would have all of these pointy tops, right? So let's go back to the actual lightning rod. And I'll just give you a quick rundown, right? If you have a metallic pointed object that goes up into the air, it helps to dispel the electricity above it. It doesn't make it impossible for it to be struck. It just lowers the odds of it being struck. And if you happen to run a conduit off of that structure, it, in the case that it is struck, then it will the, the electricity will follow that conduit down to the ground following the path of least resistance, right? If, let's suppose ancient people knew this, let's suppose that, I mean, it seems like they did, Let's suppose that they knew this, that they were aware of this, and that they designed their buildings to manipulate the flow of electricity, to keep electricity away from particular areas, and to redirect it if and when it did hit. That seems to be an intelligent idea if that were the case, right? So here's what we find. Pointed structures, right? now. There's also the opposite of this, which are domed and circular and spherical structures. Those structures attract electricity, which we also find in ancient times. Almost all the time, those, those domed structures are made of conductive material, like brass and copper and stuff, right? That's because this, this wide area, this dome shape or spherical shape, draws electricity to it. The electricity is attracted to it. But whenever there's a point and all this energy is coming up off of that point, it pushes the electricity away. I'm using simplified terms, you know, in, in, in another presentation, maybe we'll get more into the, um, the mechanics of how it works. Okay. But if you don't believe me, look it up for yourself. Lightning rods, pointed structures, pointed, me pointed metallic, anything dispels electricity. It, I mean, it, it keeps electrical strikes from happening. It prevents them, right? It doesn't make it impossible. It just lowers um, the chances of it happening. So we see this across the board on all of these ancient structures, Gothic style, right? During a time when I believe further back in time we go, we had cycles where the atmosphere was electrically amplified. And we have a historic record of this in our architecture that has survived throughout these times. We're going to talk about these. I just saw there's an obelisk right here. We're going to talk about those next. But we see this. What, what other reason would they possibly have for putting all of these pointy spikes on the top of the building? Was that to protection? Was that in case, you know, someone parachuted in from above? No. <laughs> Keep that in mind when we talk about... Um, in a minute, I'm going to talk about um, ancient armor, right? Um, it stands to... See, they, they actually have a lightning, a, a modern lightning rod on this one. You see that right there? These act as lightning rods, so this is really kind of unnecessary, right? But they put another one. This is a modern one right here, right? These are the older ones. These are lightning rods. They even have... Oftentimes, a really good lightning rod won't just be a single spike, Modern lightning rods, people started to figure out if they put more spikes sticking out in different directions, as you see here, that it would even further prevent lightning strikes. Here's another example of this ancient Gothic structure. No other reason to have these spires and these points sticking up into the air that I can think of at the moment, at this particular juncture in my life, and even if there was, I still see very good reason. If our atmosphere was electrically charged to an extreme degree where people felt like they needed to put on protective gear to just to go outside and walk around and perform daily activities like they did in the early 1700s in ancient Paris in France. Now, here's some more examples and styles right? You'll see these types of shapes coinciding with one another too. You'll have this sort of a bell shape. I'm going to talk more about the bells here in just a minute. And then these spires. No good reason to have these that I can think of. No, no practical reason to have these. And just to say, oh, well, it's just a style of architecture. It's just, no, no, no. That's just minimizing. To, to just chalk it up to saying, oh, it's, it's just a style of art. Yeah, today it is. 
but it developed from practicality. It came from somewhere, as did these bell towers, a.k.a. clock towers. We'll talk about those in a second, too. Here's another example of a giant building in the shape of a lightning rod, with smaller lightning rods all the way around it. You see that? They also have these little spikes off the top and stuff. That's to keep electricity away from this structure so that it does not get blown to pieces by the thunderbolts of the gods. You'll also notice some of these designs that are prevalent, like this. Electricity, when it did hit these buildings from above, would travel through and it would be redirected depending, you know, depending upon the architecture and the design, the architectural design, but also keep in mind that energy, oftentimes these, these cathedrals specifically, are what I call places of power. They were built upon terrestrial geographic places of power, which are cavernous openings within the earth where whenever our electrical field flowed the, in the opposite direction, or before the last polarity reversal, which we go through those, you know, from time to time, electricity comes up out of the earth. And so it comes up out of these cavernous openings and it's beneficial to us. It's healing. It, 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 it gives us, it shares many healing and positive attributes with those that it comes in contact with. Okay. I call these the blue beams. All right. But they would build these structures on top of them. You'll notice that many of these cathedrals and whatnot, while they may have stained glass windows, those are not windows that you can just open and let, let the fresh air in. These places were all closed off. Do you see any kind of windows? You know what I mean? Like, no, not really. You do see some things, but they're all stained glass, almost like they didn't want whatever was on the outside to come in. They didn't want to be seen, or they didn't want that light to come on in for some reason. These were all sectioned off, closed off, walled off. And then they have these strange designs when they did have windows, which were not windows you could open. These cathedrals had small ventilation windows or ventilation openings on them, right? On the inside, they would line they would line the cathedrals. I'll talk about steeples here in a second. But they would line these cathedrals, the walls, with pipe organs, which would vibrate the air inside, right? Which would actually be a way of tuning the frequency inside of a building that is being filled with positive energy from inside of the earth, from those cavernous catacombs and cave systems that are almost always directly beneath these types of structures where they would also bury their dead in the hopes that they would be resurrected during some type of event. Right? Anyways, um, these buildings are clearly designed. It's a high probability. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty ding certain of it, personally, that they were designed in this manner for no artistic reason at all except for maybe you know, sculptures and, you know, little ad added things that are on here. But the actual architecture itself serves a purpose. And it's the purpose is to manipulate the flow of electricity, to direct it, to use it. So let's talk about steeples. Steeples are a modern example where we have these lightning rods attached and fixed to buildings. Just like this, this right here, that's a steeple. Right? I mean, you could call it a steeple. It's a lightning rod. A lightning rod is a steeple. I asked this all the time when I was a child. Why do churches have steeples? What's the point of like having a steeple? Uh, uh, uh. That was the, that was the response I got time and time again. Uh, well, um, and then people would like just come up with some total BS instead of saying the truth, which is, man, I don't know. I have no idea why we put steeples on top of our buildings. Seems reasonable to me that a steeple is a gigantic lightning rod. That these houses of the gods or places for gathering many people into one spot. That you would want to put a huge lightning rod, which is a pointy metallic object, on the top of the building if the atmosphere around you is highly electrically charged often. 
Not just not just in the case of a thunderstorm, right? There's places that have steeples all around the world where they they hardly ever get lightning. I'm sure. Okay. So these were not just you know just in case there's a lightning or anything like that this was these were built like this the world across and continue to this day people will build these even though they don't really even need them okay you could just put like a regular lightning rod on top of your building people this just turned into tradition people did this for so long that they as 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 the atmospheric conditions slowly dwindled and lessened in their energetic amplification over time as it slowly went away people continued to see them the the steeples and the remnants of the time long forgotten and they continued to build them and to add them on when that's just what they always did they forgot why they built towers with points and spires and steeples and obelisks but i haven't some of us have not. Let's get back to this whole Benjamin Franklin invented the lightning rod garbage. <laughs> he did not. Okay? You see this? This this is a, an example. This is a paper that was drawn up quite some time ago. Let me get to my notes over here. Alright, so um, first of all, the Ming Dynasty... Ancient China, back in the the 1300s, all the way up to the 16 or 1700s, in ancient China, especially during the Ming Dynasty, historians have found evidence of lightning protection systems being used during the Ming Dynasty. These systems often involved the use of tall poles or structures, like we just showed you, made of metal, placed on rooftops to attract lightning away from buildings. Okay, well, that's not how that works, but we already covered that, right? So why, why, what's, what's, what's the purpose of really pushing this propaganda to, to, to put this guy who is not even a president or any kind of a, a leader, he was just an inventor, allegedly, right? It's because he, it's because of the group that he belonged to, Okay. Why push this guy as the inventor of all history, of all time, of the lightning rod? Or other things that he did not invent initially. He was not the discoverer of these things. That was ancient China. Wren. Now this is from Christopher Wren. This drawing right here shows you the various structures. It says down here. I'll make it big for you to read it. A parallel of some of the principal towers and steeples built by Sir Christopher Wren. Over here in my notes, it says Sir Christopher Wren, the famous English architect, proposed a lightning protection system in the late 17th century. Although it was not widely adopted, Wren's system involved using pointed metal rods mounted on top of buildings to attract lightning and conduct it safely to the ground. Now check this out. When Christopher Wren died, Ben Franklin was 17. So did, Bryn, did Ben Franklin really invent the lightning rod? No. Like, did Christopher Wren invent the lightning rod? Doubtful. Okay, highly doubtful. I'm going to go ahead and say no also. But these are different examples of things that predate Benjamin Franklin, and yet this whole Benjamin Franklin propaganda is pushed upon us. There are other examples, too, from Sweden, France, some other places, too. Um, it's thought that ancient gigantic structures must have had and included some form of lightning rod, like the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This, this right here even talks about it. Here's some, let me, let me show you these pictures once more, right? Now, oftentimes you'll see this on churches, right? Big, huge steeples. But what do these steeples in the modern age sometimes off, often have? They have these clocks, but the clocks used to be bells. These used to be bell towers. And they would have these bells on top of the buildings, or even beforehand it was more in a tower of its own, a bell tower off to the side. Sometimes they would put it on the building right? Why? Let's just suppose, just for fun, 
that the atmosphere was electrically charged at some point in the past. Highly electrically charged. So much so that people were wearing protective clothing and fashion trends and fads to keep electricity off of them. What would be the purpose of putting a bell hmm, way up there in a tower around during such times, right? And there's really interesting myths and legends related to these bells and these bell towers, especially that they would keep away evil, that they would that the sound would would keep away giants or ogres or you know demons and things of that nature. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, they say, right? This is very interesting architecture. We've got the dome at the top. We've got these little things off to the sides, which seem to be small forms of lightning rods. I'm not 100% sure, though, but I do see these quite often on many modern buildings, too, especially capitals and... Um, old courthouses and museums and things like that, right? That Places of power. Pe uh, structures built upon places of power. But then they put a big old metallic bell that, that clearly is a conductor for electricity up in this tower. What's the reason? Now, academics would say, oh, well, you know, they, they would build these bell towers so that in ancient times they didn't have good ways of calling the people together or alerting or whatnot. Yes, I'm sure there were many reasons why people had bells and, and, and many reasons for using them. But it seems to me that it might have something to do with electricity. Look at this building. Doesn't this look like a giant battery? <laughs> like, it's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Very interesting building. Now take a look. We have all of these columns around the outside of the building. Right? This shape right here is, um, this is like a horseshoe magnet. If this building was electrically charged, this would act as a type of horseshoe magnet um, directing the flow of energy through these columns down into the next portion of it. And then we have a big old metallic bell, a whole bunch of them around the top of this structure. What could possibly be the reason? Could the bells... I'm not I'm just speculating on the bells. I'm thinking of some ideas at this moment. But could these bells have been installed upon these huge towers under amplified atmospheric conditions because the electricity itself would resonate throughout the bell, being attracted to it, causing it to vibrate and make a, a, a sound like an alarm? Like, hey, there's a lot of electricity in the area. Possibly. Possibly. I don't know. I, th I find these to be very interesting. I'm sort of just speculating. I don't have a solid theory on the bells quite yet, but I did want to include this um, in the presentation, right? This whole metallic bells. And I also find it very interesting that in w World War I, in ancient, or in, in, in antiquity, I don't know how far... I don't know how long ago that, that would be to be considered ancient. But anyways, during, during the times of World War I, Germany and its leaders went around collecting hundreds of thousands of these bells. Why? The bells were seen as protective. They were seen as good luck and much more. And the Germans went around confiscating every single bell in England and other places that they came across, France, where, wherever it was. I don't have the pictures at the moment to show you, but if you Google it, you'll see hundreds of thousands of bells in fields that the Germans collected. It all seems to be connected. These shapes, the obelisk, which, in my opinion, is a gigantic lightning rod. People will teach, academics will teach, that this represents the penis of Osiris. Have you ever seen a penis that looks like that? I have not. Okay? And I would know. I've not seen a penis that looks like that, that has a pointed tip, that is square like that or anything. That's not what that is. And we are foolish for having believed such stories that come to us from alleged intellectuals. Shame. Shame on them. Look at these buildings. Look at the domes designed to attract electricity and then the columns designed 
to redistribute said electricity. Right? Those columns are, have rebar inside of them. They have metal and, and whatnot, right? They would put these in places where they did not want the electricity to be hit from above. They would put these in areas where they did want to redirect the path of said electricity. And that's why I believe, and it makes sense to me personally, that's why they would put these huge obelisks, these huge pointy uh, structures in areas of high population, populated areas of the city, places where they didn't want people to get struck by these cosmic thunderbolts of the gods that are attested to in ancient records the world across. We have many examples of these in ancient architecture as well, especially here in America, in the United States, where, where the, the, the founding people of this country, which were not the founders of this country or this land, okay, neither were the people before them, okay, it goes back a long ways. But you notice this, right? It's a big old huge tower. And then there's a, like this path. There's almost always this rectangular path, oftentimes filled with water, or sometimes it's a park, directly in front of a huge lightning rod. And on the exact opposite side, if I were to turn this picture around, you would see a dome. Does it sound like maybe positive and negative sides of a battery? One, decided, one side to repel and the other to attract? Do you think that there may be something underground down here that has to do with electricity and harnessing it and using it and manipulating it? A dome with many columns underneath it and a huge lightning rod to keep electricity away from this side. Interesting. Let's look at some more examples. We can find these huge obelisks. Now, in the modern day, I will admit obelisks and, you know, some of this antique types of architecture and stuff, they do and they have turned into art forms. And it's, it's, it's mysterious. It's captivating because we've forgotten its purpose. We've forgotten what the reason is behind it. Some don't. Some know exactly why. And, it's, and the symbolism is used so that those who know and understand can pass messages to each other in different forms, for different reasons. Here's another one. A huge obelisk up on the very top of this hill. High places. These are the high places where people would pray to the gods, etc. And they put these huge obelisks up. Because these are the areas most likely to get hit by lightning because the lightning wants to ground itself. It'll follow the, follow the, past, the path of least resistance and it'll touch the tops of hills and mountains, etc., so they would put a huge um, lightning rod on the top up here. Let's not forget France, right? Now, remember, back during the times, right around and before the times when the Eiffel Tower was actually built, we talked about how the people walked around with lightning rods on their clothing. And it was, a, it was all the rage. People were doing it. It was, a, it was a trend, a fad, whatever you want to call it. I very much doubt that there was no reason, no practical application for them, and that they were just tricked into buying some new gadget. If you look at this and you compare it to the Washington Monument, they're the exact same layout with a huge, gigantic lightning rod to keep the electricity away from one side and a dome on the other, right in front of a rectangular path connecting the two. With the building, do you see? <laughs> oh God, anyways, it's electricity. It's electrical in nature. This is practical. It's not, it has nothing to do with art or beauty or anything of the sort. These are kind of funny. Sometimes they would have little uh, umbrella hats or whatever they keep on them and stuff. This guy's got an actual church steeple on his head. I think there's a supposed to be funny articles. I'm not sure, but I thought that was interesting. Now, 1700s in France was not, I don't believe, the first time that people wore clothing 
or armor to protect them from electricity. What you see right now is called chainmail. Just one form. There was many forms of chainmail, right? People wore chainmail, especially during the medieval times, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, times when I believe our atmosphere was at its highest electrical charge, which necessitated people wearing metal in certain ways because they would be electrically charged. Like, let's just suppose that the atmosphere was extremely electrically charged. People go out. Your, remember I said domes attract electricity? Well, your dome is called a dome. Your head's called a dome, right? It's going to attract electrical charges. Your hair is probably going to stand up on end, etc. And there's a high likelihood that you would get zapped to varying degrees of power, right? Or electrical magnitude or whatever. So people wore metal on their bodies. This may have served other purposes over time, as, especially as um, that electrical charge dissipated, as, as I've talked about, and, and was pulled into the earth over time to charge. But initially, these knights, these, these people that wore chain mail, this is a Faraday suit. This is the same thing, except for to a more extreme degree, that was, that was exhibited in, in France in the 1700s. The exact same thing, okay? But it's, it seems to me that we can see the trend of the charge in the atmosphere by looking at things like the architecture and the clothing or the armor or things like that, right? If modern academics would have you and I believe that these were the elite fighting forces of kings and queens. Let's take a look at these. Okay. Let's take a good look. Uh, let's see. Where's a, where's a really... I want to see this one right here. Now, let's say this guy comes up to you. Have you ever gone trick-or-treating when you were a kid? And when in the 80s, they used to have these plastic masks with like a little rubber string behind it. And... If you've ever worn one of those, and, and you have the kind that have little slits for eyes, you know, I know you know, from personal experience, you cannot see out of that. You have to turn your whole body left and right just to be able to try to map out where you are in your mind. These were not elite fighters. This was not protective clothing to go into battle during war. This was not to protect from swords or arrows. Although, yeah, I'm sure it could do that. But if this dude with these slits for eyes, his little vision is like, he, this is his field of view. He can't breathe in that thing. There's all sorts of problems. It's, it's very heavy. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's no way. I will never believe. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to believe ever at this, at this moment. I can't see myself ever believing that this was an elite fighting uniform for anything. And, unless maybe, possibly, if you're fighting some sort of a monster, which also existed during the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. However, this would be great if you're going into areas that were known to be extremely electrically amplified and charged, then you could have your explorers put on these types of suits and go into these cavernous systems and other places, especially those explorers that might be looking for like the Fountain of Youth or other places that are probably electrically charged, right? Or, if you're having your explorers go into these areas that are known to have precious metals, which also would carry an electrical charge if the atmosphere reciprocated, right? You would have and expect to see points at the tops where the, where the atmosphere, you know, the electricity is above you. So you would want a pointy top to your, to your helmets, and your hats and things of that nature because they act as lightning rods. Like this little stripe, it doesn't have to be one singular point. You can have like a little mohawk type deal as long as it's metallic and it will keep the, the electricity away or it will help to keep the electricity away. 
I would whoop any of these dudes without any armor at all. If they have a big pike, I'll show you the pike too, okay? If they have a big big stick with like a sharp piece of metal at the end, we're going to talk about that. And they're coming at me in like 300 pounds of metal and they can only see this much. Yeah, I'm whooping that dude. Like, man, I wouldn't even need armor or anything, okay? These, these people did not fight in wars. They didn't fight in one-on-one -on -one battles. It became a sport after this was useless, after the electric charge dwindled from our atmosphere and people forgot, just like the architecture, people forgot the reason why they had these special heroes, which were just explorers, right? Who came back with tales of fighting dragons, which is electricity, right? Or serpents, or wonderful serpents, or fiery serpents, etc. Right? And they would always fight them with a sword, or a, a pike, um, like a, a staff with like a piece of metal knife or whatever on the end of it. That's, that's how they would fight the dragon. They would always defeat the dragon with a sword, some sort of pointed metal. Every time. Never a bow and arrow. Or heart rarely ever a bow and arrow. But it was always some sort of pointed metal. Because they were not fighting physical, actual creatures. They were fighting against electricity. As they were exploring the, the, the different parts of the world that were electrically amplified during those times. But whenever that electricity dwindled and became lessened and lessened over time, people still had the armor. They still had those jobs. They still had those elite forces. So they had to put them to work. They had to use them for something and they had them fight each other. Battling it out in, in little tournaments for sport. And, and sport is just recreation or recreating um, pretending, right? Ancient sports to amuse the people. The people started remembering the sport and they forgot about the origins. You'll notice that oftentimes these knights or guards or whatever you want to call them that, that sometimes actually had to stand outside on post, outside of the castle gates and whatnot, right? Have these pikes, there's different names for these staffs that have metallic points on the top, right? But this is this is not good for actually fighting, okay? It's not the greatest weapon to have. You'd rather have a dagger or a sword or something that's easily maneuverable, not some huge, you know, heavy, hard-to-manage type of a deal. And yes, you know, they might have had them while they were on horses and that turned into jousting or whatever, However, if you're jousting, you're going to get one shot with that. You ever think about that? It's not like they went around just just jousting, you know, 30 or 40 people or whatever. No, man, those things, the, especially the wooden ones, they would break off. They're, they're not useful for war and actually fighting. What they are useful for is keeping electricity away as many portable lightning rods during a time when the atmosphere was electrically charged. This guy right here, this, this particular visor, many of these remind me of the Star Wars Stormtroopers. I believe that's why they were called that. The troops out in the storm, in the, electric, in the electrified environment, right? And you'll notice off, quite often, the further back in time you go, you'll see these little points. Their hats, their helmets are all pointed and, met, and metallic. Now, they also made this type of armor or Faraday suits for their horses. Why? Not so that their horses were protected. You could easily just take a sword to these legs down here at the bottom and just drop these horses real quick, right? It wasn't to protect them from pikes or swords or anything of the sort. It was to keep static electricity off of them when they were riding through it when the, at when the atmosphere was electrically charged, right? You go through it, you, if you, the faster you go through an electrically charged atmosphere with the wind and everything you know, pushing against you, you build up static electricity. And you could die if you were shocked and, and the, electricity, the, the electrical charge was strong enough. So they would put metal on the horses as well. They would ride around with these, with these lances and pikes and whatnot straight up into the air. To, as extra precaution to keep electricity off and away from them. They developed helmets during wartime, metallic in nature. This is lightning rod fashion, way before France ever even came up with the idea. Right? 
metallic hats with points, metallic little things on top. And I, I've talked about this a few times in the past, and I've had people leave comments saying, oh, that was for extra protection. Or First of all, let's address that this was fashionable. Okay, yeah, maybe over time, after it lost its practicality, it became fashionable, but you don't want to wear stuff like this when you're actually going to war. When you're in war, you want to be agile. You don't want someone to just grab you by your horn of your helmet and, you know what I mean? It's, it's terrible. It is not practical. If your purpose is to kill the bad guys or the, the opposition, it, it's counterintuitive to the whole thing. Putting a spike on top, some people tell me that that's, that's you know, in case, in case they run out of weapons and they want to headbutt somebody. If that were the case, you'd have a, a spike more towards the front so you can actually ram people rushing toward them instead of not looking at them, pointing your head straight down and hoping that you ram into them. That's not the purpose of this. And you also notice that oftentimes there's this metallic mesh or chainmail that hangs down from these helmets. Right? Often, they, they, many times they would actually have a little thing, a divider that goes down over the nose, not to protect you from being punched in the nose, to protect your eyes from electrical shock so that the electricity would go all the way down and avoid your eyes so you wouldn't go blind. Which is why you often, here's another example. You know, you'll see um, the chainmail just hanging off in front of the face. Is this practical to fight with your view blocked? Do we believe that any longer? Can we? Can we accept these fables that are told to us by academics? Over time, if it, if it loses its practicality, then it becomes an ornament. Then it becomes a fashion. Then it becomes artistic. But if you're a warrior, you could care less about how beautiful it is. You could care less about how you know, designs on it or whatever. If you're not going to fight and you're the king and you want to look like a warrior and pretend, then yeah, you give the king something that looks like that, that has pictures all over it and, you know, big things on top of it so that they can feel like they're a part of things. But the real warriors could care less. And in ancient times, they would walk around with spikes on their helmets, even during up to close to modern times. World War I, many countries, and, 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 and before World War I, many countries had their armies wear spikes on their helmets, not for any type, type of intimidation. That's not intimidating. I, I mean, I, I don't find it intimidating. I can't speak for everyone. But it's not intimidating. It's, it's, it had to have served a purpose. If you're out in the open... This is lightning rod fashion, but the military, when they're out in the fields and they're all over the place, putting spikes on top of their heads, or little um, metallic, what do you call it? Mohawks. Here, here's a, here's a really good example of both, okay? You've got the spike and the metallic mohawk. During relatively modern times, it was practical. It served a purpose. After it stopped serving its purpose, people didn't want to just get rid of them altogether. That would be a waste. They continued to use them, but then they, they over time, forgot the purpose that they originally served. So, yes, maybe over time it just became tradition or it became decorative. Now, take a look at these bayonets. Let's talk about bayonets. In a time when you have actual guns that shoot actual bullets... You, a bayonet is ridiculous. I'm, I'm telling you from personal experience. I was a Marine. I used and trained with bayonets. They're stupid. Okay? Unless you take it off the gun and use it as an actual knife, then it becomes more practical. But having an... Uh, I mean, in, in, in the modern age, okay, your average infantryman, your, 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 your rifle weighs about, I don't know, eight, eight nine pounds or something. Okay, on average, mine did. You just put a, a big old huge metal knife on the end of that, on the tip of that, weighing down the front part of it. it you're not going to want to just go try to stab someone with your rifle or whatnot. They do teach people how to use them when, when you're in close combat. But it's not practical to fight with these. 
Okay, you would rather have a sword. You would rather have an actual knife than to use your big old heavy, stupid gun to try to stab and hopefully poke somebody. I don't believe that these were the actual original purposes of these. These are lightning rods, and they would march around and carry their lightning rods with them, with their little pointed hats, little metallic pointed hats, because the atmosphere was more electrically charged to the further back in time we go. And we have been losing that charge and that energy, which corresponds to our lifespans shrinking and disease increasing and, and you know, many other things until it's restored, until it returns one of these days, which it will, and it does because it's cyclical. But you can imagine all of these troops walking around, targets to electrical shock. So they all decide to take their guns, hold them upright, which I wouldn't want to do. If I was marching, I would rather be at port arms. I would rather be at the ready or something. If I'm in war, if I'm out there in the field, if I'm going, you know, if I could possibly be shot, no, not even. Like, I'm not, I don't want to hold my weapon like that at shoulder arms walking around unless there's danger from above. Then I, yes, I do. I want everyone to do that because all together as a group, we, the odds of lightning striking us and judgment being cast upon us from the gods above or from God or whatever, from the devil, whoever you want to see it as, are less likely. And, and look at these, right? They're not even like knives. The, the, the really old bayonets, the new bayonets, they're, they're more like actual knives, okay? Being like they're sharp on one side and the other. These are not. Look at these. These are just metallic rods. They're just points. They're not designed to cut and slice. They're not even designed to poke. This would break. This would likely break. This is easily... This is not a weapon. Just like... The armor of ancient knights and of medieval times is not armor f for to protect from humans. Okay, so these people would carry all of their pikes and their bayonets and other things, and they would march with them up in the air to protect the troops from electric shock. Stands to reason. This is my theory. This is what I believe in. It's not mine. But I just wanted to bring back some of this ancient oblivion, forgotten history, to the forefronts of our minds. When, in, during ancient times when the atmosphere was more electrically charged. And if that's so, we should see that in other places too, right? Like on ships, on the very tops, acting as natural lightning rods and oftentimes putting actual lightning rods on the tops of ships so that they wouldn't get struck and then over time they would put flags and decorate them and stuff just like they did on their little pointed hats they would put little fluffy things over time when they lost their their purpose how about ancient carriages if you take a look at many of these older carriages you'll see that they are surrounded by little tiny lightning rods or types of little tiny i mean it's not just decoration what is that what is what what even is that why is that? Is that pretty? You know what I mean? What is it for? For the same reason that people put this on a crown that's made of metal and stick it on their heads to protect their leader. Same reason that they would make all of this like a little Faraday cage to protect their leader in these royal carriages. You see that? The atmosphere was different. Our world was different. It was more of fantasy. This is where fantasy and fiction come from. They're, they're not fake. They're not lies. They're reality that we have forgotten about. Because we're just, we just think the modern world is all there ever was. And anything further back than the modern times is yesteryear and didn't really exist. And people were dumb and stupid and had no type of technology or mechanical um, abilities. Right? Same things. You see these on many of these carriages. Boom. At the top. Now, this particular one I took a picture of, you can see it's domed on the top. So these are not to keep, you know, luggage or anything like in the Wild West, how they had a little, you know, crates or whatever on the top or whatever. No. This was, you didn't put anything up here because it, would, it could get destroyed or stolen or many other things. Okay? These are little lightning rods to keep, to protect royalty in these royal carriages. 
Makes sense to me. Anyways. And that's our presentation for tonight. If you found some value and you thought this was entertaining or interesting at the very least, I hope you'll share this video with others that you feel may appreciate it and gain some insight into our ancient oblivion. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamers saying good vibes and goodbye.